Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Ellen Fanning. Coming up... Day by day, Victorian health authorities on edge as a nasty COVID variant spreads among strangers in Melbourne. It's still not clear how many aged care workers have been vaccinated, but the minister responsible says it's all going fine. We're comfortable about where we're at. Could have, everybody would have liked to have, have done it faster, but logistically, uh, we've done it as quickly as we possibly could. Number two tennis champion Naomi Osaka withdraws from the French Open after revealing her struggle with depression. Joining me on the panel tonight, Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Sydney, Lisa Jackson-Pulver. Always interesting to spend an evening with you. It's lovely to see you again. And our virtual friends in Melbourne, reconstructive plastic surgeon, Dr Neela Janika Ramanak. Good to see you. Hi, Ellen. At home with three kids in Brisbane, Director of Research and Operations at new independent think tank, the Blueprint Institute. Daniel de Hotman. Good to see you, Daniel. Great to be here. Thanks for giving us a go. And in Townsville, former federal LNP member Ewan Jones. Hi, Ewan, how are you going? Good, thanks, Ellen. How are you? Good, always great to see you. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag The Drum, and we're on Facebook. Health officials say it's still too early to say when Melbourne's SNAP seven day lockdown will be extended beyond Thursday night, whether it will be. In fact, we may not know until Thursday. Three new cases of COVID were recorded overnight, bringing the total number of active cases in Victoria to 54. And authorities are citing concerns that the virus is being transmitted via fleeting contact. What we're seeing now clearly is people who are, you know, they're, they're brushing past each other in a small shop. They're, 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 you know, they're going around a display home. Uh, they're, having, they're, 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 doing a, they're looking at phones in a, in a Telstra shop. This is very, relatively speaking, relatively fleeting contact. They don't know each other's names. Uh, and that's very different from where we've been before. We think it's a, primarily a feature of the Indian variant, which is that it is just that much more contagious. Not in every single person. So we, we're, we're seeing examples where people are not transmitting at all. As yet, no further cases have emerged at the two aged care homes where two workers and a resident earlier tested positive. And the good news is vaccinations are still continuing at a clip, with more than 20,000 administered yesterday. Lisa, that's scary. Way... Yes. Did you hear what he was saying? It is. Way more contagious. Yep. And that yep. it, close contacts aren't you and I coughing on one another. That's right. It's me walking past you in... Exactly. ..to get the eggs in the supermarket. Exactly. And this is the thing with variants, and this is the thing with having uh, not as many people vaccinated uh, as we possibly can. Part of the story here... And we must consider that if we have a higher proportion of people vaccinated, the likelihood of variants getting out of control is reduced. Um, so the real story here is please get out, get vaccinated. We've got to get it right. Um, these variants are going to continue until we start getting a much, much higher level of vaccine efficacy across our nation. Um, it's going to take time. We must be patient, but we all also must be incredibly diligent. Mm. Check into everything. Make sure you know exactly where you are. Be methodical and, and consistent about your hand washing and your mask wearing. It's critical. So the, the Wuhan um, variant, the original COVID-19, that's pretty much gone, is it? And now we're seeing these other stronger variants that have kind of emerged in this Darwinian race to infect and yeah. damage humans. Yeah. They're the ones that are emerging that are even, um, I think, more beastly is the expression they used in Victoria. And there's a batch of them circulating. And, and that happens when enough people get it and the vaccine kind of... I mean, the, vi the virus gets better at being a virus. Exactly, yeah. OK, and if you have uh, the vaccine... Does that necessarily mean you won't spread it? Because there was some question today about whether that would have made any difference if more people had been vaccinated. What makes a difference is the type of illness that you get. The likelihood of you getting severe illness is much reduced if you've been vaccinated. The likelihood of vulnerable people getting really crook is much lower if a large proportion of people are vaccinated. So really it's about making sure that the pool of individuals that are in any given community or environment, such as Australia, for example, if the majority of them have got some sort of resistance to this bug as afforded by a vaccine, uh, then the likelihood of that bug being able to get out of control in the way that we're seeing some variants of COVID doing uh, is much reduced. So, Neela, you're in uh, Melbourne tonight. Interpret for us what the public health officials are saying there. Inter that they're talking about the vaccine. They're warning people about how much more contagious it is and they're kind of doing it with their eyebrows approaching their hairline, right? They're, they're, they're looking alarmed. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
so who's more vulnerable and what does that mean for the likelihood of, of, of getting you all out of your homes again? Look, I think that if we... We actually have in Victoria really good data and really good understanding of how the virus transmits at a baseline level from last year. And I think that what we now have is this incredible opportunity to track this outbreak almost from its very start using really sophisticated, a very teched up, very capable contact tracing team. So what I think we're actually seeing is this real evidence of epidemic spread in a way that it perhaps hasn't been tracked possibly anywhere else in the world um, because it got so out of control in so many places so early. Um, so yes, there is concern um, watching the, the press conferences. And in part, I think that's because no one in Victoria wants an extended lockdown like we had last year. Um, I personally listen to the press conferences and the data that is coming out. I overall am fairly well reassured that the public health teams are doing a pretty good job um, of linking things together and um, putting out the information that people need about these uh, venues where fleeting contact might have um, might have occurred so that we can actually get people isolating and not forward transmitting the virus before they realise that they're carrying it. And I think regardless of whatever variant is circulating in the community, that what we have come to understand about this particular virus is that airborne transmission is a real feature of how it spreads and that not everyone spreads the virus to the same degree um, and not necessarily even within the same course of the illness uh, at the same time. So we do have to continue to be vigilant. And regardless of however this virus changes, I think that if we take on board those principles of being vigilant, protecting ourselves through means such as vaccination um, and being aware that even you know, short amounts of contact, you know, a door opening for 18 seconds, walking past someone in a supermarket. Um, and I say this not to make anyone fearful of leaving their house, that that's not the intent of it at all. It is just to say that we now do have vaccination as protection and mm. we can access that to protect ourselves and other people. Um, I want to turn to you, Daniel. You trained as a, as a doctor, you trained in rural areas of Victoria and you've gone on uh, to work in, a, in, in general policy at the Blueprint Institute now, and you've got some ideas on how to get more Australians to take up the vaccine <laughs> quicker. What are you thinking of? Yes, absolutely. Well, I agree completely with the comments made so far. First thing to say is it's an absolute tragedy that the poor people of Melbourne have gone into lockdown again after going through so much over the course of the pandemic. But really, this is all about vaccines, and, you know, the government likes to talk about the fact that this isn't a race, but... Actually, that's exactly how many other countries are viewing it. If we'd gone at the same pace and started at the same time as the US and the UK, we probably wouldn't be in the situations um, that we're in right now. And we now have an opportunity to make sure that we can increase our pace of vaccination so that when the next crisis happens, we're not in the, such a precarious situation. So we think that the government should be thinking about incentives. So whether this be providing free Ubers or transport to getting vaccinated, right. whether it be by um, whether it be through other incentives such as perhaps like we have no no jab no pay or no jab no play for st school children, maybe it should be no jab no franking credits. Um, <laughs> we need to we need to ado adopt every measure we can to get more people vaccinated as quickly as possible because the virus isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay and we need to make sure we can protect lives and protect the economy. Yeah. You and I, I'm really interested. I mean, you've got a great um, head for retail <clears throat> politics. You know, Morrison said over and over again it's not a race. He stopped saying that now, but the Deputy Prime Minister McCormack used that language on Sunday, it's not a race. Um, that's not what the experts are telling us. Like, what's the impact of that kind of language coming from Canberra? I, I think it's really mixed at the moment. It doesn't seem to make any sense to me, because I agree with everyone else there. It is a race at the moment to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And whilst we were slow out of the gates and we wanted to be very measured and all that sort of thing, and I think if, if Greg Hunt had his time again, he probably would have um, uh, chosen his words maybe a little bit differently. But if you see the way that the UK and the US are doing it, I was listening to a podcast on The, Gu on the Guardian the other morning. You know, they've got lotteries in, in the US mm. that you know, for every five million people, someone wins a, someone wins a million bucks or $100,000. So, you know, they've got celebrities and former presidents and everyone coming out and saying, you've got to get vaccinated. Because at the end of the day, as, uh, like um, uh, Neela said, it's it, it, if we can get that... It's, it's like people over 60 who are not getting your flu needle, you know, getting your flu needle. So if you do get it, 
uh, you know, that you are able to just withstand it. And I think it's going to be led by younger people now. They do see with this second wave going through that there is an imperative there. And I think any government that doesn't react to that, any government that doesn't drive it forward uh, at, at any level of government, be it local government level, uh, we've got to be facilitating these things that we can get people vaccinated. Mm. And people will stand the queue. If People will stand the queue to get it done mm. if, if there's a purpose to it. We, you know, we've got to get this done, and it's, and it's really important now. And, and just give me a bit of Queensland homespun philosophy. Y your mother turned 90 the other day. What did she say? Do you think the mood is turning? Because she's going to be our litmus test. What did she say about the vaccine rollout? Uh, my, my mum, the closest thing my mum gets to swear is to buy the livens and dinners. Whatever what that, that means, I don't know. Buy, buy what? Buy the, buy the livens and dinners. Right, buy the livens uh, and I've dinners. Gotten, yeah, no I've idea what it means. That's exactly right. I, I think it means bloody hell. Yeah. Uh, but but <laughs> mum would never say that. My mum turned 90. So, But but she said, you know, for goodness sake, why can't we just get it, get everyone done and get it done now? And surely it's not that hard. So if my mum... Uh, you know, who's, who's still driving. So I'm very lucky with my mum and that sort of thing. If she can get out there and say that we can, we can get these things done, if we can get our first needles done, my brothers have had their needles done. In, in Townsville, I've sort of, I'm waiting for my, my GP to tell me when to come in. But in Townsville, we've got 90% detached housing. We don't have public transport. The risks are a lot less, except for next week when we've got state of origin. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but if, if if we can, you know, it, it is a race, and I think younger people are going to be demanding. Everyone's going to be demanding, but I think it'll be led by younger people mm. to push this thing through and get, you know, extract the digit and really start pushing things through. Mm, maybe we need a, a, an ad campaign with Mrs Jones, eh? Hey? By the That's it. by the livings and dinners, go and get yourself vaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> get yourself bloody vaccinated. Ellen. There'll be a clip. There'll be a clip over the year if you don't. That's you know? it. I could work. Sounds like a plan. It sounds like a plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ellen, can I just say, as as a healthcare worker who worked in hospitals through the um, the wave of infections last year, and you know I don't work in ICU or in emergency, but I'm in theatres where we generate aerosols, and the the, the fear that we all felt last year, the the change, I wish I could bottle the feeling of walking into a hospital this year fully vaccinated mm. um, and mm. the feeling of protection and safety that gives me. And all of a sudden, you know, I still care about having the right mask and I still care about PPE and I still care about all of those other things. But knowing that that layer of protection is there for me and therefore for my family is just such a profound relief that I wish I could bottle that feeling and send it around to the whole country because I'm sure everyone would want to be vaccinated mm. at that point. Mm. I've had one dose and I feel, I feel you know, halfway along that journey, that real sense of relief. <laughs> Coming up, the current crisis in Victoria has uncovered a range of serious issues in the vaccine rollout. There are a few very simple questions we need answered. We'll get to all of that in a few minutes. Tennis star Naomi Osaka has withdrawn from the French Open, citing an ongoing struggle with her mental health. Last week, the world number two flummoxed tournament organisers after declaring she would no longer participate in post-match press conferences. She was subsequently slapped with a $19,000 fine and told by Grand Slam managers she risked being thrown out of the tournament altogether. Overnight, she took the decision out of their hands. The truth is, I have suffered long bouts of depression since the US Open in 2018, and I have had a really hard time coping with that. So here in Paris, I was already feeling vulnerable and anxious, so I thought it was better to exercise self-care and skip the press conferences. I'm going to take some time away from the court now, but when the time is right, I really want to work with the tour to discuss ways we can make things better for the players, press and fans. Ms Osaka said she feels huge waves of anxiety when she's forced to front the media. Here she is speaking in 2018. Like yesterday I just woke up and I was really depressed but I don't know why. I was able to win two matches um, but I feel like that doesn't really say I can play well on clay. It's more I think I'm just an okay player that was able to play okay. I, like, I'm so sad right now. I... Uh, she seemed pretty um, upset now uh, there, uh, Ewan, and she's given us a sense that she's been battling with that depression ever since. Um, 
What do you say? Is it just part of the game you've got to do the press conferences or do you just say, well, if you insist on it, you lose a great star? Uh, look, as, as someone who takes antidepressants, as someone who has issues around that sort of thing, anyone who battles, uh, you have to be able to um, cope with it, make sure your medication is right, make sure your health is right. I do feel, though, that she's doing, you know, and being an elite sports person and probably not having the most grounded of lives and all that sort of stuff, that this sort of thing, it, it's, it's part of the contract that is there, and I think there are ways of doing it. And I think if you saw her, her press conference there, if you've ever seen Wayne Bennett, uh, for the coach of the South Sydney mm -hmm. Rabbitohs, if you've mm -hmm. ever seen him do a press conference, he adopts, the, he adopts the thing of tell them nothing and be careful how you say it. Uh, and and by, be, the journalist gets sick of it before he does. Uh, and I think there's, if she just had someone around her just to compartment, compartmentalise it, I'm not saying it's easy. But she is an elite sports person. She, if she wins the Grand Slam, she picks up over $2 million US. Uh, and finding her $15,000 is akin to a cup of coffee for me. So pulling out of something where you could win $2 million says that she's fairly well off financially. You know, the, the depression's not a, not a joke, not a joking matter, and I'm not trying to belittle her or anything like that. But she's in a very privileged position. It doesn't excuse you, doesn't say you don't get these sorts of issues, but she's just got to get some help around that. And, okay. And, you know, all those things. It's, just, it's, it's, it's You can do it. You at, can cope with it. At the same time, though, Lisa, I mean, Wayne, nobody's ever asked Wayne Bennett to, no. to put on a tennis skirt and go down to what passes for a beach in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry, Melbourne. Um, <laughs> you know, with a magnum of champagne and yeah. spray it all around and whiz the skirt around as a publicity shoot. No, I mean, I'd like to see Wayne do that, but I, I don't think he'd ever be called upon to do it. No, and it's very sad that elite athletes such as this very brave young woman can't negotiate balance. She's asking for help. She asked for help when she was younger. She's asking for help now. She needs some time out to do what she needs to do. She sounds to me like she wants to play tennis, but the rules preclude her from playing tennis. Is she it entertaining enough to... just to watch her play tennis? I think she's phenomenal. Oh. And I don't, I don't see that as entertainment. I see that as incredible athleticism and it's a joy to behold someone who is so good at that. But there is a package with all, with all elite, there's always a package that comes with them. They're a complete person. And she, in her honesty, is a complete person, is saying, I can do this, but I can't do that. Mm. So why can't we say, all right, let's work out what that means. Look after her mental health, look after her physical health. We've grown this extraordinary athlete. Um, why can't we rejoice in the whole package? Mm. Daniel, do you think um, this is going to backfire on the uh, organisers of the French Open? I think it's possible when you see some of the media coming out at the moment and for the most part I you know it must be an incredibly difficult time for Naomi and um, you know mental health strikes everyone um, it doesn't matter whether you're an elite athlete um, a politician you know someone in the spotlight and to have the spotlight shone on her at a point of such difficulty must be yeah, incredibly challenging and terrible um, I think that one of the great things about her coming out to talk about this issue is it encourages others to come out and speak, and it also encourages those well, who. Well, I mean, arguably might not have it doesn't. Arguably, it doesn't. She's had to, right? She's had to walk away, Neela. I mean, she, she, you know, she. It didn't work. She said, I, I, I want this balance in my life. I don't want to do this part. And I want to do this part. And they said, Well, chuck you out. And she said, All right, well, I'll go. Yeah, uh, and I think that this is. I think we need to be really clear about what ha what has happened here, which is that she has been judged for not being capable temporarily of doing something that is entirely unrelated to her core business of existing. She's a tennis player. She is there to win matches. And I think that, you know, as a society, we, we do need to ask ourselves what we ask of people that we allow into these public spaces, whether that's authors or musicians or sports people or politicians or whoever it is. You know, I, I feel like with the the um, amount of information that is available and able to be transmitted, we continue to ask people for more and more and more of themselves. And I think that it is appropriate sometimes for people to say, no, actually, I'd like a little boundary. And for us and for tournament organisers and other people in positions of power to say, 
well, is this thing that we are asking of this person directly related to the core business of what they do? You know, for mm. every woman who's been told you can't be a surgeon because you have babies or, you know, you can't, you know, do this other thing because there's this other thing going on. You know, you have diabetes, so therefore we must put you on night shift. You know, these are the things we hear all of the time. And all it means is that really good people are boxed out of being able to do the things that they're very good at because we put these extraneous expectations on mm. them. And I, I, I think that we need to move away from that. Mm. And it's interesting, I wonder whether it ha would have happened. I mean, people will have a view at home, maybe put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook. Years ago, it used mm. to be that we put our heroes on a pedestal and we yeah. wanted them to be unattainable and unreachable. Right. And now we want them to be, it seems, accessible and ordinary and available. Mm. And I wonder whether or not she's just of a different time. You're watching the drama and with me on the panel is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Sydney, Lisa Jackson-Pulver. In Melbourne, Reconstructive Plastic Surgeon, Dr Neela Janika Ramanan. In Brisbane, Director of Research and Operations at the new independent think tank, the Blueprint Institute, Daniel de Hotman. And in Townsville, former federal M uh, LNP member, oh, I did it again, Ewan, Ewan Jones. You know, when COVID swept through Victoria last year, it cut a swathe through residential aged care facilities. By the time the state's restrictions were lifted in November, 80% of all COVID deaths in Victoria were in aged care. So it seems inconceivable that we would be facing the issues again now. The virus once again in aged care and the vaccine rollout falling behind. Here's the aged care minister today. Are you seriously comfortable with the pace of this rollout? Uh, yes, Senator, I stand by the words that I've put to the media. And, Senator, the reason that I do that is as I've explained publicly. This is a significant logistical exercise. There remain some very simple but important questions that the government has, up until now, been unable to answer. To help us tackle them, we're joined by Rick Morton, senior reporter at The Saturday Paper, who's done a deep dive into what's going on in Victoria at the moment. Thanks for coming in. First, let's look at how many residents in Victorian aged care have been vaccinated. Well, we now know from a Senate hearing this morning that 44,333 aged care residents have received a first dose. Of those, 25,319 have received a second, and that means only 57% of residents in Victoria have full protection that you get from having both doses. Now, when the vaccine rollout began in February, the government put aged care residents into its highest priority category, A1, and promised that they would be vaccinated within six weeks. That deadline passed eight weeks ago. They are running two months behind. But to listen to the federal government, you'd think the vaccine rollout in aged care is going very well. The difference this time is that 100% of facilities in Victoria uh, have had uh, that first dose. Now, did you hear that? 100% of facilities have had the first dose. That's an interesting statistic, but the more important one is that only 57% of residents have had their crucial second dose, which gives them the full protection from the vaccine. And here's why that matters. A recent UK study has shown that the first dose of either COVID vaccine available in this country is only 33% effective against the Indian variant, the very variant, that is currently circulating through Victoria. And that protection only rises to 80 or 90% once they've had their second shot. So, Rick, then let's think about the language the government is using. The aged care minister, Colbeck, says he's comfortable that only 57% of aged care residents are fully vaccinated. And the health minister using that strange terminology, 100% of facilities have been vaccinated, which is pretty meaningless because you can't vaccinate a building. No, you can't. Um, <laughs> we don't need a study to show that. I mean, this just goes to show, I think, um, that they cannot bring themselves to admit that things have gone wrong. And they couldn't bring themselves to admit that things went wrong in the federally funded, run and regulated um, private aged care system last year, where, you know, some 680-something people, residents, died. And because they couldn't bring themselves to admit anything went wrong, they haven't done anything to change the behaviours that might have allowed them to get the vaccine program right now. And it, it's, it's, it's actually driving me a little bit mad because I was watching it today and it's like, we went through this. We went through this last year. 
where they tried every trick in the book to shift the blame, say that it wasn't up to them, blame the providers, even though the providers were being regulated by someone who was both the cop on the beat and also meant to be telling them how to do their jobs to protect lives. And they were scared to bring um, concerns to this regulator in case they'd get pinged. And, 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 and what ended up happening was both. And it was such a quagmire. Um, and you would have thought that maybe they would have taken something away from that, and they haven't. I mean, they knew the flu season was coming up. They knew that winter was coming. Uh, and to have the highest priority group in the nation still not vaccinated uh, by what is now June, mm. I mean, I don't think there's any um, argument except that they just didn't care enough. Now, they might say, of course we care, and I would believe them. They don't want people to die. But there are degrees here. And if, you know, this is the biggest government in Australia, it's the federal government, they have all the resources they need and they should have made this, at, like their national cabinet, mm. a war footing. And they didn't. Because, um, and I feel for people at home because there seems to be a real disconnect between the sort of anxiety we all fear when we look on our phones and it says aged care residents, aged care workers have COVID and we all go, oh. And then we see those health officials saying, this is a really serious variant, people walking past each other in the Telstra shop, get it. And then you hear this soothing language from the aged care minister saying, look, he's comfortable with it, it's a logistical exercise and so forth. And it's confusing. It is. And, and it confuses everyone because this is part of the language that has contributed to the hesitancy effect uh, with COVID-19 vaccinations in this country. It's not a race. We're comfortable. We're doing great compared to the rest of the world. People were complacent because of that. Um, the government was complacent with aged care. You saw the news yesterday that was reported that they um, removed the guideline um, that stopped workers working across multiple facilities. Now, that's what we saw happen in Victoria. It's almost like this entire rollout was predicated on their sincere hope, no evidence, but their sincere hope that we wouldn't have another outbreak. Certainly not one with a variant when we all knew full well that there were variants raging around the world, particularly in India. And you can't build policy on that kind of groundless hope. You just can't do it. Well, the next question is how many aged care workers have been vaccinated? Speaking to Radio National this morning, the aged care minister had this to offer. It's about just under 40,000 have received two doses. So we've delivered across about the country. across the country that we're aware of. But by his own admission, those numbers are incomplete. They only take in workers who manage to grab the leftover doses in aged care after the residents had been vaccinated. A few hours later, when asked in a Senate committee how many workers had received the vaccine in Victoria specifically, the aged care minister was unable to answer. Instead, he explained that from Friday, he would be requesting this information from the providers. We will be requiring uh, aged care providers to report that data to us alongside their reporting of vaccination of flu vaccine. But you don't know? Well, we don't have that data, com complete and data yet. Now, this matters because we know from the outbreak in Victoria last year that staff, who obviously don't realise they're infected, are the ones who are generally bringing COVID into aged care. In fact, that was the case 84% of the time in 2020. So, Rick, let's get this straight. The government prioritised the vaccination of aged care workers. They were in the top priority group, but they had no way to record how many of them actually got a vaccine. Is that right? Yes, and that's the common thread throughout this entire story. They don't know how many staff there are even. Um, the, the figure they're using of, you know, 366,000 aged care workers is from 2016. Uh, they don't have an update on that. They don't have an update for disability um, residential workers. They don't have, you know, they, they got the numbers wrong for the number of disability, um, people with disability living in those congregate care or group home settings. Um, they um, merged the two numbers together for both aged care and disability care, um, such that they actually got both estimates wrong. Um, and there is a lack of, uh, they have no line of sight. So this is, goes back to the fundamental issues with aged care full stop, which is that they don't know where the money goes when they send the care subsidy. They don't know how many staff there are. Um, they don't know what all the aged care providers do with the massive bonds that are paid to them. They can put them in you know, other companies that are connected through the corporate structure, but they can't tell. Uh, and they don't know precisely what happens on the floor. And this is 
uh, one of the most severe outcomes of that. And th the thing here that I think illustrates the complete lack of care is that they don't care enough to find out. Even when they have suffered, um, residents have suffered, uh, and the government has then kind of weathered that storm uh, of criticism, rightly, they still haven't changed their behaviour. Like Everything they're doing right now has been done quickly uh, because there was an outbreak. Um, and it just strikes me that you can't claim good management if that is the way, if you're reacting constantly. Particularly, you know, last year their excuse was, we've never had a pandemic like this before. That was their excuse last year, and we're learning. We have learned a lot. Um, the Newmarch House and Dorothy Henderson Lodge episodes were in March last year, um, March and April. Mm. And they were workers um, who seeded the virus unknowingly uh, in these institutions. And we are now, you know, 12, 13, 14 months down the track. What have we learned? It's, 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 I, I don't know how, it's like, it's maddening. It really is. Mm. The final element here, it seems that part of the problem is the process for getting those aged care workers vaccinated. On the government's own website, they say they're making it as easy as possible for workers in residential aged care to get vaccinated quickly and safely. But the rest of the advice will be familiar to any member of the public who has gone to get a vaccine. You can see your GP or go to the state mass vaccination hub or you can get a jab, hope to get a jab, when residents of an aged care facility are vaccinated if there's some left over. But on that, take a look at this guidance for workers from the federal government. Throughout the aged care rollout, workers can get a Pfizer vaccine where doses are available following the vaccination of residents. They're the leftover vaccines. That same advice goes on to say that workers who get a first dose on the day that residents are receiving their second dose will have to procure their own second vaccine with no support from the authorities. And with so much confusion, the Victorian government is now undertaking their own process to get workers the jab. We'll be undertaking a five-day vaccine blitz to ensure workers in these vulnerable settings are protected against, um, against coronavirus. This means from Wednesday the 2nd of June to Sunday the 6th of June, workers in private sector aged care facilities and the residential disability sector, which are all managed by the Commonwealth, will be given priority access to walk-in vaccination hubs around Victoria between 9 and 4pm when they present evidence of their employment. And so, Rick, just a quick question on this, because mm. I want to go to the panel, but um, so if they're essentially on their own, like the rest of us, to get a vaccine, mm. is what it seems, yes, they can mark 1A, but they have to go out and get, find it, and That's... we know from the Royal Commission that these are sometimes casual workers, often with English as a second language, right. um, in what sense, then, has the vaccination of these people been prioritised? How has it been prioritised? Well, I mean, it hasn't. But here's the thing, what that guidance... That guidance is very recent. Um, at the very beginning, I'm speaking to people uh, who work in aged care for a story for this weekend's um, Saturday paper, and they were told at the very beginning, you will get vaccinated along with the residents. We're sending the in-reach team to you. So people who could have gone out and got their own vaccine, if they were in those age brackets when mm. they became eligible, didn't because they thought they were going to get done with the facilities. Um, they have been misled um, at every turn to the point now where we have so few vaccinated as a proportion of the entire workforce. It's less than 10%. Um, and they were not prioritised. And it, there's a distinct lack of understanding, I think, here from the government. It's like they think residents in aged care are their own entity, but this is a public health emergency. To protect residents, it's not just about vaccinating the residents. It's about vaccinating everyone they come into contact with. Mm. And, and that includes not, not only the... the, the the, the mm. aged care workers, the care workers themselves, mm. but the cleaners and the cooks mm -hmm. and the chefs yep. and all those people who are not even included in this conversation that we're having, right. who are in who the are facility. Who are even more lowly paid yeah, um, yeah. and even more likely to be from a migrant background. OK, so what do we do now? We've got to do something, don't we? We have to really... We should have learnt the lessons from 14, 15 yeah, but we months ago. So what are we We're doing? really bright. So let's get those vaccines rolled out to those aged care facilities. It, does, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, if we don't do something substantial in those facilities, we are going to lose our elders. We're going to lose a whole stack of people. We have to recognise that many people are very poorly paid, as you've stated. Um, why don't we have additional COVID leave? Why don't we have additional uh, support packages for those people when they do have to go home sick? and be able to recover well enough to be able to return to work, hopefully with jabs in their arms. We're better than this as a nation. We're better than this. We should know where people are. We should know what they're doing and we should 
Jolly will know exactly how many workers we're dealing with. It can't be that hard. And mm. It's really not. <laughs> it can't be that they're hard. They're doing it now, they're doing a survey. So. Mm. Yeah, way late. Uh, Neela, um, you know, we knew a lot of this from the Royal, Aged Care Royal Commission, right? We knew that there were going to be issues with mm. cognition for some people in aged care. We knew that there were going to be issues uh, with aged care workers because, as I say, they tend to have English as a second language and therefore they might be getting, um, you know, the same dopey information a lot of us are getting about vaccines. Um, how difficult is it to turn this around? Oh, I think if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, my impression, um, I treat a lot of aged care workers as patients. Um, there, there's a lot of upper limb injuries in that population. My impression of uh, healthcare workers and aged care workers in general is that there is very, very low levels of vaccine hesitancy or anti-vaccination sentiment. If people aren't vaccinated, it's because there have been structural barriers to them actually getting access to the vaccine. You know, these are... You know, leaving aside the language issues, I don't think that that contributes necessarily to vaccine hesitancy, but it certainly contributes to um, being unable to navigate the extremely difficult system of even booking a vaccination uh, up until, in Victoria, really, the last week, and now the phone lines are really busy. Um, so I absolutely welcome the priority queue for, for aged care workers, acknowledging that in that five-day period, it will be difficult for people to get time off work to actually attend. Mm. It will cost them money in terms of petrol. It will cost them money in terms of parking. Um, and a lot of health facilities, and I say this with no judgment, um, have discouraged staff from getting vaccinated in a group because we know that low-level uh, side effects are common after this vaccination. You know, a little bit of a sniffle, a little bit of a fever. Um, I certainly had a bit of a fever after one of my vaccinations. I wasn't unwell but it meant I couldn't go to work the next day because uh, COVID restrictions yeah, right. on entering healthcare workplaces means that, that you can't turn up. So um, this is one of the challenges of, you know, taking a bus to the aged care facility and vaccinating all of the staff because if half of them can't work the next day, you have residents that um, can't, don't have their carers. And so, but, but all of these are foreseeable issues. Okay. And, and this is the thing that is frustrating. Let me go to Ewan on this. Ewan, just a, yeah. a quick answer if you can, because we're short on time, okay? And, and, re and just really answer it if you can. It, it, it seems that, how does politics work? Can anything change unless uh, there's an acknowledgement, there's some accountability for what the experts say is a stuff up in this rollout. Do we have to first hear the Prime Minister or somebody say, OK, this is not going well, time out, let's do something different? Uh, no, I don't know how to answer that one quickly. Uh, what I do see is that we are in, you know, I don't want to use the word crisis, but this is very, very serious. Uh, you know, if you could turn, put them all in one place and not let anyone go home, this is this is going to be a lot easier to handle, but that's not going to happen. But but also, uh, but, but you're saying it's very very serious. We've we've heard uh, you know public health expert here, another doctor on the panel, and Rick who's done a deep dive into it all, saying this is very very serious. But from the government, we're saying we're comfortable, and 100% of facilities have had had a vaccine. So is it important for that language to change before change happens in politics? What's the rule? Yeah, I, I don't. So I, two things you can see: it can be the duck. Uh, you know, on, on top on top of the water, we're all calm. It's nice, easy underneath, we're paddling like bloody mad. Uh, to, to sit there and say things like, you know, there could be a vaccine there for you if there's anything left over at the end, that's that's poor management for mine. Because even you know, someone is, you know, I'm 61 years old. I'm two more, two two years older than my IQ. Uh, <laughs> you know, even, even I can tell that. Even I can tell that. You know, that where where are people going to get a get infected from, they're going to get from people coming in and yeah, going. Yeah. They should have been the first people okay. done. All right. But but I work I work with I work with NGOs and government departments and that sort of thing, people with disability and aged care here uh, in Townsville. And some of them can't tell you how many people work for them. Uh, it's because it's a casual economy, because there's a, they work mm. across a number of Structural things. Structural issues, right? It is right? not that simple. Mm. It is not that simple. And, Rick, I'm going to get in trouble upstairs with the timing, but yeah. I heard the Minister this morning say, yeah. OK, we're trying to get uh, the providers themselves mm. to tender. It's not a competitive yes. tender. Anyone who wants to, any provider, can, can vaccinate yes. their own staff. We've spoken to one provider with 4,000-plus beds, independent living units, saying they abandoned their effort to fill in the paperwork in March. 52-page yep. request for tender, 130-page, five-page contract with impossible conditions. I've read those documents. Yeah, <laughs> one of them said IT requirements would defeat ASIO 
and to quote them, the tender process is the perfect roadblock to participation. But this is what the Minister is touting yeah. as a solution. And it does seem like a great idea. Are there, is there any sign that under the water the duck is fixing the no. tender process? No. I mean, I reported on this tender at the, at the weekend, just gone. And it doesn't close until June 30. Um, when I asked the Department of Health last week, they had no, um, had watered no tenders. Um, they said the evaluation process was ongoing. Uh, today at Senate Estimates, they've awarded one. Um, to TLC, to a provider. But why would it? Why would you need? I mean, if someone wants to vaccinate their aged care workers, well, wouldn't you say, "Have at it, have the, just go send for the it." Vaccine we'll back up the truck. Them. Yeah, just send it to them. Right. Um, or get the other um, vehicles, or even the other contractors, because there are a million of them: Aspen and Sonic and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Australia Healthcare. Send them to do the job. Um, send someone to do the job. The, the, the original sin of this entire project, I think, and according to other experts as well, is that the Commonwealth saw. Um, uh, an opportunity to take the credit for a vaccine rollout and they um, assumed more control than is tradition and they have wrecked it and I think that was a reckless act. Mm. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks, Helen. Rick Morton, Senior Reporter at The Saturday Paper. <music> Knowledge, they say is power. But in Australia, how and where do you acquire that knowledge? That's an increasingly a question answered along class lines. The OECD ranks us ninth worst out of 77 countries for the equitable allocation of resources between disadvantaged and advantaged schools. And as the Drumsdale Drinkwater reports, this continues to influence what the highest echelons of our society look like. It's a typical Aussie morning on a typical Aussie day And I love this place I was born in Australia, the lucky country where hard yakka battlers get a fair go if they just Have a go, we can do it Have a go If you're having a go, you'll get a go That's how we got the country started But if leading the country is the thing you want to have a go at History suggests you've got to get a uni degree under your belt to wear those suit pants. Talk about lying straight in bed, and what about you? The last Australian Prime Minister to serve in office without a university degree was Paul Keating in 1996. Just let's remind us, who gave us the worst recession in 60 years? Paul Keating. Since then, all of our Prime Ministers have been tertiary educated and all since 2013 have attended a religious, private or selective school. Two have even attended Oxford on Rhodes scholarships. The 4th of June at Eton. This is what used to be called the top drawer, the preserve of the English ruling class and the source of most of their virtues. The UK has had a similar experience. Eton College, a prestigious boys' boarding school, has 20 former Prime Ministers and its alumni, including Boris Johnson. In France, the École Nationale d'Administration, with its tough entry exams and Middle Ages chapel, has been dubbed a pathway to power. It too has educated several French presidents, including Emmanuel Macron. Back in Australia, where you are educated doesn't just determine your political success. A crikey investigation in 2018 revealed just two law schools educated more than half of the 53 judges in the High Court since Federation. The rest were mostly educated at the remaining group of eight universities, most of which are colloquially called the Sandstones, for obvious reasons. Of those 53 judges, less than a quarter attended a public school. That's compared to the two-thirds of the broader population who are enrolled in the public system. And according to an OECD report, Australia has become the fourth most class-segregated education system among member countries. For author, journalist and activist Bree Lee, the realisation education could be unequal came while visiting a friend on a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford University. She was struck by the thought that she didn't belong and not because she wasn't smart enough. Bree Lee's new book, Who Gets to be Smart?, is an examination of the ideas, structures and systems that influence how and where we're educated and ultimately the success we enjoy in life, deservedly or not. And I'm pleased to say that Bree joins us now. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Um, 
I, I want you to take me to, to Oxford University. You're 26 years old and you visit your mate Damien, the brilliant Damien, yes. who's a Rhodes Scholar and he's got all these fancy cheeses mm -hmm. in his bar fridge and you walk past people in the quad. Is it the yes. quad? Yep. I don't know, I'm a bogan yes. from Logan. <laughs> in the quad where, um, I don't know, they're studying nuclear physics or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. and he's poncing about like he owns the place. And how do you feel in that setting? Oh... The analogy I used was, you know, the girl who tries a dress on that she knows she can't afford. Um, you know, when my friend, who is brilliant and lovely, I should say, Damien, he, when he won this scholarship, it was like getting sort of kicked in the stomach a bit because everything I had been taught at school growing up um, told me that, that that meant he was a winner mm. and I was a loser. Um, and I would love to be able to say that the other scholars I met were rude and that I had valid reasons to sort of be <laughs> resentful of them, but they were lovely. Um, and, and it just, um, yeah, it made me feel really inferior. And that was a time in my life before researching and writing this book when I felt that because he was a winner like that, it meant that I was a loser. Mm. And there was something about um, seeing it as a milestone for brilliance in youth. So then what happens where, I mean, you're no slouch, uh, you're well educated, uh, you coulda, woulda, shoulda, yeah. but when you're at dinner with them at Oxford, how do you, how do you feel like you're not keeping up? Or oh, what? absolutely. Because, you know, a Rhodes Scholarship is one of, I think, a few, like maybe half a dozen examples of an absolute pinnacle of academic achievement. But see, I don't agree. Well, the school that Damien went to, the yeah. high school, um, until the year that he won the award, they would ring a bell and give all of the students a day off when <laughs> any student became either a priest or a Rhodes Scholar. Uh -huh. And it's the butt of jokes in Mission Impossible 4 that these guys aren't even Rhodes Scholars. I think it is in, in those sort of academic settings and has become in sort of popular culture and acknowledgement a, a shorthand term for a, for a brainiac, for mm. like the best of the best. Mm. And then, then the, the comes the question of who who gets access and whether this is equal and on, or, or, or unequal or it was ever designed to be. Mm. And I remember as a kid, you know, from the back blocks of Logan, and it was always a mystery to me how people even knew about these scholarships. Yeah. Mm. And then you'd hear that somebody had got one and that they'd arrive back in Brisbane and they'd be fast-tracked into a law partnership or something, yep. and then they'd get pre-selected and then they'd be... And you'd think to yourself, I never picked up that he was that smart. Mm. You know, mm. really? Was he really? And maybe he wasn't. <laughs> you know? Do well, you think that's possible? That he was kind of bright, but no brighter than anybody else? Well, I... Well... Speaking from my experience with my friend Damien, he comes from a family in which both his parents and every single one of his siblings is a doctor. OK, well, let me, let me go to somebody who, who fits that description as well. Yeah. Daniel, you're Exhibit A. <laughs> you were a Rhodes Scholar, which means you got a free scholarship to study at Oxford. Um, were you just smarter than everybody else, my friend? <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, I think that... It's obviously, I don't think anyone deserves a Rhodes Scholarship, to be honest with you. That's something one of my mentors told me, uh, and I was very fortunate enough to receive it. And it's amaz an amazing accolade, and it opens up lots of opportunity. But I think, for me at least, personally, um, when, I, when I did get it, I, I tried to think about the ways that I could use it to try and make the biggest positive impact I could, because it is a privilege, and I definitely don't deserve it. I don't think anyone does, hey, but, but I'm going to try and do the best I can with it. You, you grew up in Cairns. And, and you went to a local school there. Did you mm. see a divide emerge that wasn't necessarily along the lines of those who were the best and the brightest, but who your dad was, who your mum was and what your sort of academic background was like, right? Yeah. Um, so my school in Cairns, it was a Morris Brothers school, but we had a, a wide variety of people from different backgrounds. You know, many of my really good friends are now tradies, some have gone to university. But I, I do get a sense, perhaps the bigger divide I see is between my friends in Cairns and then the people I went to university with in Melbourne. So when I was at Monash, for example, the vast majority of people at, in medical school that I, that I knew had gone to private schools in Melbourne or, or on some in Sydney. Um, and I think in terms of the topic of this discussion, there is something to be said for the role that um, those advantageous experiences like private school have 
in facilitating advantage and not necessarily for people who are any smarter than others, just that they had more opportunities to pursue um, different advantages, I suppose. And I guess, Ewan, when you think about it, that comes down to if you're going for to be the judge's associate and you need a reference or you want to be joining a law firm and you want a reference, if the reference comes from the local butcher who says Ewan turned up every Saturday morning at 6.30 and is handy with a knife, or you've got uh, a reference from the local judge saying this fellow's sharp, well, we know who's going to get the judge's associate. Is that, is that the thinking behind it? And do you think that's true? Uh, it depends if he's a meat eater or not. He might be able to get some good shots. <laughs> but, uh, look, uh, just one thing on Chris on on, on uh, road scholarships. And suppose Chris Christopherson's a, a road scholar, uh, and you wouldn't think that he's a brainiac. And suppose he's done pretty well for himself. But yeah. uh, and I think one of the criteria for getting a road scholarship is what you will do for society once you graduate. Um, I was once in a conversation over a cup of tea with Malcolm Turnbull. Joe Hockey and uh, Tony Abbott. And inside my head, they were talking, inside my head, I was getting the Sesame Street thing saying, going, one of these things <laughs> is not like the other. But can I tell you... That, 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 because you didn't man, go to uni. Because you didn't I go didn't to go. uni. And you're... I went to uni to pick up the cars for sale. That's, what, that's as close as I got. But, but, but uh, look, I, I didn't get... Malcolm Turnbull and Tony Abbott are both road scholars and more... Uh, open communication people I've ever had. Uh, they, are, they, they are really good people to me. They were really good people to me. They never lorded over me. I went to a GPS school. I went to boarding school in Toowoomba, a Toowoomba grammar school, but most of my mates were off the farms. I do see that old boy network working, though. If you are going to be a judge's associate, going to Churchill, or Brisbane Grammar or Gregory Terrace will always do very, very well for you, or Morris Brothers, or one of the big schools. I agree with, with, uh, with Daniel on that. Uh, but as far as the leaders, I want you to hope we don't push too far down this thing. Um, yeah. I know degrees are worth more at different universities. The sandstone degrees are always worth more, but it doesn't make you a better engineer. Mm. It does, certainly doesn't make you a better engineer. And can I tell you, if I was around a table with a bunch of people at, at, at Oxford, and I've never been to the UK, but if I, but if I had been around a table, I'd be telling them jokes. I'd be dominating that conversation within 15 minutes. So, that, and they'd know all about it. They'd know all about Townsville and why Townsville's <laughs> better than Cairns, Daniel. <laughs> Neil, though, I do, I do wonder whether or not Ewan Jones would be a Minister of the Crown in a safe seat if he was uh, more a member of the boys' club and had got a law degree from Queensland University. Do you think there's something to that? Oh, look, I, you know, I, I'm going to sympathise briefly with Bree, who had a friend who was a Rhodes Scholar. I had a cousin who was a Rhodes Scholar and an Indian mother who reminded me of that very often. Um, <laughs> I, 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 um, I, I do think that, you know, there is this veneer and I, 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 I'm really looking forward to reading Bree's book. Um, I, I think that it is an important, this educational elitism is an important point. Um, and it kind of fits in with what I was saying about Naomi Osaka and the expectations we put on people outside of what we, what their core duties are, is that there is this expectation that we will have these amazing degrees, these amazing educational opportunities, which are so embedded in privilege that, you know, if you can't afford them, if you don't have time for them, you don't know how to access them, there are so many structural barriers that doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that you can't have people who are really good at their job, who are really kind, who represent, you know, their electorate um, and have a really good conversation. So I, I think I guess, that, I guess that wouldn't matter to if find it, a way. It, I'm sorry, we're short on time, but I guess that wouldn't yeah. matter, Neela, if, it, if there wasn't a sense, and do you have this sense, that it's policed, that um, you're smart because, like Daniel, you went to Monash and you're a surgeon, so therefore you must be smart. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It is definitely policed and I think that even, um, you know, coming from a slightly diverse background, walking into spaces where that policing occurs is a really confronting experience. And it takes time and it takes um, companionship uh, and it takes sponsorship to overcome some of these barriers. And these are things that I've been lucky to get. Um, and, you know, I'm not just lucky, uh, but but there is an element of luck and there is an element of, um, of having 
you know, this innate privilege. And so I think that, you know, for the best society that we can possibly build, we need to look at what these barriers are and, and allow a greater diversity of people to access these educational spaces. Well, Prof, how are you going to answer this, Professor? Because you <laughs> grew up... tricky, isn't it? A, a, an but Indigenous not... kid, yep. um, exactly. homeless at times, and yep. now you're the two I see of the grandest sandstone well, university one, one in the them, country. One of, them, one okay. of the two ICs. <laughs> one of the many. Um, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And it's about what happens around the kitchen table at dinner time. You know, in my world, there was absolutely no discussion whatsoever about going to university. I mean, there are people in my family who, who don't know today what a Rhodes Scholar is. And, you know, I only recently learned really what a Rhodes Scholar is when... Anyhow. But the thing is, is that... Let alone now... apply for one. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, but nowadays, we do have some opportunities. They're not as many as we need. There is still a gross inequity when we look at who's running the universities, who's uh, going to universities, who's got these amazing opportunities to be able to go and study abroad as part of their program of learning and lifelong learning. Aurora Foundation, for example, runs a number of fantastic scholarships for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander graduates to be able to get just that experience so you can have those absolute family and community changing conversations when a kid grows up and they hear auntie or uncle talking about their time when they were abroad or at university or studying to become a doctor or a lawyer, that that changes their lives. They but, but see to, in their But to be really harsh with you, is Sydney University just tacking that on because it is an elite institution? Isn't it the regional universities close to home that are doing the hard yakka with the first and family kids? It's all of us. It's well, all of us. Just... We have no choice. We have to do it. I mean, have Sydney to, University yes. and Melbourne um, were the two universities that started graduating Aboriginal people way back when. Yeah. I agree okay. with that. And but these are really it's... important things to, to note. So Over 80% yeah. of yeah. equity students at a tertiary level in Australia at, are at the non-five sandstones. Mm. Oh, yeah, I don't disagree with you, and we do have to do better. Yeah. But that doesn't mean... Um, that we need to get into a competitive thing. We have to give people the opportunity to be able to do what their hearts desire. Mm. Because you're right, you don't have to be 100% ATAR to be a brilliant surgeon. We've got, we got a minute engineer. left, Brie. Mm. It, the reality is we, we don't draw our Prime Ministers from that small little gene pool that they do in the UK, do they? Right. I mean, the class system mm -hmm. isn't what it is here. How would you articulate what elitism is like in Australia? I would say that... We tell ourselves a myth about meritocracy and it works at both extremes. We tell ourselves that poor people are poor because they don't work hard enough and we also tell ourselves that rich people are where they are because they quote unquote deserve it. And it's socioeconomic currents and those currents start at kindy prep preschool and the currents get stronger and stronger throughout secondary schools and then they're just cemented by university. Hmm. And what do we do about it? <laughs> in 20 seconds? Yeah, about that. Uh, the first thing that I would say um, is that it's absurd that we consider, as we should, um, education for five-year-olds and above to be a right and it's freely accessible, even if it's in, if unfairly funded. And for whatever reason, yeah. education for kids four and under is welfare. And we have one in five children in Australia, one in five, 20% of five-year-olds starting without having met their developmental milestones. So and then they go to the public schools that are less funded and it gets worse and worse. OK, so start at three and four years old. Absolutely. Wonderful to have you in. What a wonderful, raucous conversation we had. Thanks for all that. Our guest, <laughs> Bree Lee, and, of course, our panel, Lisa Jackson-Pulver, Neela and Daniel and you. And have a great evening. Jules is in tomorrow. Good night to you.